So welcome to the Parks and Recreation Summer Sermon Series. Today, we are going to visit Mount Rainier National Park. This park is named for the big, huge mountain that is within it. The original people that named it were the Salish tribe, and they named it Tahoma. We know it as Mount Rainier. And this mountain is huge, not necessarily in height, because some of you have been to even higher ones. It's 14,000 feet, but there is a road that goes around the perimeter of it that is 93 miles long. That gives you a sense of the breadth of this mountain. It is absolutely enormous and it is majestic. People come to the park just to look at it. Very few climb it. On the top of it, it has more glaciers than any other mountain in the lower 48. It is ice virtually at the top. And what people notice about Rainier is that it is said to play peekaboo with the world all day long as clouds move in and out from its peak. It's a smoldering giant, and it looks almost like it's smoking here, but those are just clouds, but it is an active volcano. One of the tricky things about Mount Rainier is that you could leave Seattle and drive there, and it would be a perfect, in perfect condition. And then in moments, it could be bad weather. There could be clouds covering it. And so if you went to the park just to see the mountaintop of Mount Rainier, not only might you be disappointed, but you would miss so much beauty that is in the rest of the park. The thing about Mount Rainier is that you can, no, no one can see it just by looking at it. You can't see the, the whole of it. Really, the only way to view the entirety of the mountain is if you were up in the air in a helicopter or in a plane looking down. That is how grand it is. So when my dad was 40, in his 40s at some point, he and his brother decided they were going to climb it. They're one of those rare people that were going to climb this mountain. And so they, they landed on Mount Rainier as, the, as their first big climb because they knew that like world-renowned guides did outfits that helped people hike this. And they, they wanted to go with some trusted folks. Their guide was this guy named Philip Herschel. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he was the first person to summit, what's the big one called? Everest without oxygen. That was, my, that was his guide. Pretty cool, right? So it's a process though. So you get, to, you get to the bottom and it's called Paradise Inn. And then you get up in the, early in the morning and you hike to, Muir, to the Muir campsite. And that you stay there for days, not because you need days to acclimate or because you have to get fit. You're already supposed to be fit. You're already supposed to be acclimated. No, because for two days, you have to practice the worst case scenarios of what could happen. So one morning, one, they spent doing what's called crevasse rescue. Crevasse rescue, as in like the glacier collapses and someone falls in it, like those nightmare things that you see on movies. They had, every one of them had to go down into the crevasse and then practice getting each other out. Because as they were going to summit, at any point, the glacier could break and they might have to rescue one another. The next day, they had to learn what's called self-arrest. And that, that means saving yourself if you begin to slide or fall off the mountain. At this point, as my dad is retelling this to me, I'm like, there is no way my mom knew that this is what he was doing. Like, there's just no way that we were aware that it was like, it, it, more people have died trying to climb this mountain than any other mountain in the lower 48. It is a dangerous mountain to climb. Back to self-arrest, basically what you do is you take your pickaxe, your ice axe, and you throw it over your shoulder, you roll your body, and you just hold on, hoping that the axe is gonna get into the ice somewhere. I mean, it was nuts. So he tells, he tells me that the third morning is when you wake up to do the ascent. And you get up at 2 a.m. And then they put in their gear, they've got all their gear going, and they're going. He said, one mile in, one mile in. 
he couldn't see his hand in front of his face. The weather had changed that quickly. Started clear, one mile in, can't see the hand in front of his face. And he hears the guide say, okay, we're gonna clamp onto each other, rope up, put your clamp-ons on your feet, and you will go if the person in front of you is going. And you're just gonna trust that you're gonna get through it. He said it lasted like that for two hours. And then four hours later, they were at the summit. The thing about Mount Rainier, though, is it is surrounded by this amazing park. And most of us are never going to get to have that mountaintop experience that my dad and his brother had. And look what we would miss. Did you know that there is a temperate rainforest in Mount Rainier National Park? And then there is these waterfalls all over the park. And granted, you see Mount Rainier in the distance, this just captivating, majestic thing, but there's a lot more to be seen. Here's another one. And then you would get the wildflowers in all of the plains below. And look at this, y'all. This is Snow Lake. And here's one of our families who visited this park. Notice it's like snowy, and yet there's two people in shorts. And then here's another one before the lake. This park has so much beauty and diverse terrain, but when it's compared to the mountain within it, you might think that that isn't good enough. That's B team. That's like off Broadway. When you've got Mount Rainier before you, all the rest just kind of pales in comparison. And I think this is true when we think about God revealing God's self to us and how we experience God. Because if you have had a mountaintop experience, wasn't it awesome? And you want it again and again, if you could feel the spirit of God. You could feel the presence of God. It was so palpable. And you want that again and again, but, but the truth is that is not how life is. Most of life is not lived on the mountaintop. God is revealing God's self through everyday things. And this was something that the people of Israel really struggled with. When you think about the people of Israel and the story of Exodus, the first thing we see the way that God reveals God's self to humanity in Exodus is through a burning bush. I mean, that's pretty, pretty visible, right? And then how does God reveal God's self to the people, to the, all the people? He, he takes a river and piles it up so that it stops on one side and they are allowed to cross across dry land. That's pretty powerful. And then they get into the wilderness and they're complaining and God's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal myself to you. Here's some food on the ground. Just miraculously, when you wake up, you'll be able to eat. There's a pillar of cloud by day and there's a pillar of fire by night. They get to the mountain and then Moses goes up and a huge cloud descends. I mean, God has revealed I am real. And you can see me and you can sense me. And he was consumable. He was so easy to point, that's God. But then the second time that Moses goes up on the mountain, God tells him, I want you to take 70 elders with you. And I want you to go up there because I have more that I want to tell you. Well, the, while they're up there, they're up there too long. And the people begin to not be content with what they have seen, all the revelations. They are longing for that fire and that smoke and that cloud. They are wanting mountaintop experiences. And so they say to Aaron, we need a God that we can see. We need a God that we can worship. Here's all of our gold. And Aaron melts down all the gold and makes it into the shape of a golden calf, and they look at that calf, they look at the calf, and they say, thanks be to God who brought us out of Egypt. Needless to say, God is very, very ticked off. God hears that this is happening, and, and Moses steps in and says, 
God, we need you to reveal yourself in a different way. Do not destroy this people. Take me instead. Take me instead. And God is so amazing and awesome that God reveals a new side to God's character. Not necessarily what Moses asked for, but completely God. And hear what he said in the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, I I will also do this thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And God said, I will make all of my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you the name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But God said, you cannot see my face, for no one shall see me and live. And the Lord continued, see, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my, away my hand, and you shall see my back. But my face shall not be seen. This is the word of the Lord. It brings me comfort that Moses, who had already seen God as a burning bush, who had already seen God split a river so that people could cross over, he has seen God do crazy, powerful things. Even Moses says, show me your glory. Reveal yourself to me. It, it, it touches at this part inside of us that we like for God to be tangible. We like for God to be consumable. We like for God to be something that is touch and feel. We want that. God reveals to Moses in a new way. He says, show me your glory, but he doesn't do what Moses or anyone thinks. He says, this is what's going to happen. I am the Lord. I am Jehovah. I am the one who exists. And I am just going to tell you, I will give mercy and I will give grace to who I want. Now God has revealed God's self as a merciful God. The same God that Pastor Stephen referred to in the book of Lamentations. This God, who my, his faithfulness, it has to do with mercy. It has to do with grace. These are not things that the world offers. These are not light. These are not light things. This is huge for the people of Israel. No longer is it about how you act, how it is about what God chooses to do out of grace and mercy. But stories like this are so hard to relate to because I don't know about you, but I haven't had like a mountaintop burning bush, God clearly speaking to me, moment. Those are very, very rare. Some people have them once in their entire life. But the words that God says to Moses are so relatable. Because while all of us are longing for that mountaintop experience, God knows that what we need more than a feeling, what we need is grace and mercy. And we need to know that God is revealing God's self in the everyday simple things. Because when we experience grace and mercy, that is God revealing God's self. When we witness grace and mercy happening around us, that is God revealing himself. When we offer grace and mercy, that is God revealing himself. And God does this over and over to us. It is not always going to be on a clear, perfectly weathered, beautiful mountaintop. It will be in the whiteouts. It will be in the times when we have to clamp on to one another, pulling through life. And our challenge is to see how is God revealing in our lives. So this past week at Bible school, every morning, all of the children and adult leaders would gather right in here, and we would dance and sing. And then every e afternoon, we would come back, and we would have this time called God sightings. And then 
Story Night would come out and ask all the children to share their God sightings with one another. What was so amazing about this is at the beginning of the week, there was a few kids that would share, and they were like, I saw God at snack time. And the adults were like, we did too. <laughs> They're like, I saw God at, in the gym. And then they, it, it got deeper. It was like, I saw God in my mom. I saw God in my dad. And then over and over and over, we kept hearing, I saw God in my leaders. And you all have to know that these leaders, so many of you that are in here, they were middle school and high school students who gave up four days of their summer to just be with these kids and to know them by name. At the end of the week went on, every single child, one, and, and a middle school and high school student, wanted to share a God sighting. You see, God is not just a mountaintop experience. It was in the everyday things in life. God is saying, grace and mercy, I am revealing myself to you. I am so here. So when you see the clouds over the lakes or it over throughout the hill country, I want you to remember God is revealing himself. God is present. God is very, very much involved. And when you have moments of mercy and grace, in that very moment, that is a revelation of God. May it be so in my life and in yours.